Hello everyone, I am here with Tash Peterson, otherwise known as Vegan Booty. Tash, hello, thank you so much for being on my channel. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. So I have got some questions I'd like to ask. I have absolutely admired the activism you have done. So the way I found out about Tash initially is my dad sent me an article about you. And he was like, you need to check out this activist. She's amazing. Like she's going and she's doing activism in person in front of people. And so he thought it was really cool. So he sent it to me and I was like, this is awesome. I love what this chick's doing. I immediately got on Instagram, started following you, hit you up, found your clothing <laughs> and we're here now. I know, I'm so stoked to be speaking with you. <laughs> amazing, oh, awesome. All right, so let's jump right in. Tash, give us a brief summary of you, your journey and your activism. All right, so I've been vegan for just over four years now and I just made the change overnight after watching the documentary Food Choices on Netflix. And I just knew learning the facts about the inherent cruelty in animal agriculture and the impact that it's having on the planet that I was going completely against my morals and values and I had to change from that moment onwards. I knew that I would be vegan for life because it really resonated with my um, compassion and love for other beings on this planet and just knowing that we should respect all forms of life and obviously looking after our planet as well. And my activism journey started pretty soon after that because I just became passionate about it so quickly. I just wanted everyone to know the truth. And initially I really did focus on the environmental impacts because that's what um, was sort of a great interest uh, that I've had since childhood, essentially. So I just, you know, post things online about, you know, animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change and all this sort of thing. And then soon after I really learned about animal rights and how important it is to advocate for that. And my activism journey started um, when I joined a couple of animal rights organizations such as Anonymous for the Voiceless and the Save Movement. And then a couple of years ago, an organization called Direct Action Everywhere became a chapter here in Perth. And that's, that group had started in the US and then we decided to bring it here to Australia and that's when I really found my true passion for disruption and creating social change and how important it is to get out there and sort of disrupt the system um, to actually get your voice out there because that's what's going to gain the media attention and actually get people listening to the message. Definitely. So yeah. that's sort of led to me doing the sort of activism that I do now. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, how are you going to get people's attention? If you're not going to be disruptive, you've got to make noise. Now, with Direct Action Everywhere, is this a vegan organization? Did it stem from, say, animal cruelty, the animal agriculture industry? Is that what it's built on? Yes, exactly. It's all based on yeah animal rights and a, a huge focus on animal liberation. Amazing. Um, so it's apparent when an activist is very outspoken and doing and using whatever tools and techniques they have available to themselves that the public often will attack them or that the activists will be met with a lot of resilience and a lot of often violent opposition. Now, why do you think this is? Why does the public react like this to your work or to that vegan teacher's work? It's because they're being met with a truth and the realization that they've been lied to their entire life. And most people would say that they care about animals and animals do deserve rights yet they're directly paying people to rape, enslave and murder them. So when they're met with this truth, they're being pointed out on their hypocrisy, their moral hypocrisy. So that's why it's just sort of like a standard human reaction to react with aggression because you're just being so confronted with something that is so blatantly obvious, but you're so, you, like our society's become so brainwashed think otherwise and to think that we are caring for the animals and the planet but the consumption of animal products is directly participating in a holocaust so that's probably initially why a lot of people have opposition and it's occurred throughout history um Suffragette. even with 
Yeah, exactly. And the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement, all of those activists were hated by the general public. And, and that's because that's they were pointing out a huge truth to, the, to what was occurring and this huge injustice. Definitely. And it's something I think we often forget. Like we forget that at that period in time when these people were being outspoken and demanding change, that they were met with a lot of anger and a lot of hatred. But we forget that because what we see is what came out of it. So we don't actually know or think about and acknowledge what was going on at the time and the climate at the time around those movements. It seems to be forgotten or not discussed enough. You know, they were met. It wasn't an easy process. It didn't happen overnight. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of battling for these people that were pushing for the change, for the, for the good. Exactly. And I was just really studying this today and looking into it and sort of becoming aware of what was actually happening to those activists at their time. Activists literally died during their activism. Women were imprisoned, they were starved. And then, um, yeah, just so many horrific things happened. They were fully humiliated by men because they were demanding the rights for women and the right to vote. And um, obviously that change happened very rapidly because they were all taking direct action to create that social change. You know, you point out that they're met with this truth that they can't handle. And the thing is, this truth, it's like, it is so disturbing. It is so messed up what we are doing that people don't, they can't even begin to comprehend or accept that they could even be participating in this atrocity. And now on an industrialized scale, it is just insane. Um, and so, yeah, you, they've told the truth and they cannot handle it. They do not want to accept that they are complicit in this. They are actually funding it. You know how you give money to charity or you donate here or there to help? Yeah, well, what they're doing is they're donating and they're giving money to this Holocaust, to this abuse, to just, I can't, you can't even put in words how horrific it is what we're doing. And um, yeah, so they just freak out. <laughs> Triggered. Exactly. Yeah, no one wants to change their lifestyle and when they realise they are a hypocrite and they are literally paying people to rape, abuse and murder non-human animals um, and they just freak out because, oh, I can't live without eating animal products because that's the way we've been conditioned and brainwashed by society in these industries and people don't realise how easy it is to switch. It is so easy to stop paying people to murder animals and... They just will find any excuse to uh, continue living the way that they do. And this brings me to my next question, which is, are you uh, that vegan teacher? Am I? Are we racists? Are we anti-Semitics? Are we homophobic? You know, that is one of the things that they will do. They will find these labels. They'll find snippets. They'll try and get information. They'll try and create these issues with the messenger, with us, with activists that are especially outspoken like yourself and that vegan teacher. And so what they'll do is they'll label us with the most heavy label possible. So that way they don't have to confront what it is that they are contributing to their hypocrisy. Exactly. Exactly, they'll detract, detract themselves from the entire message and find anything to grasp onto to take away from the actual message of animal suffering. A hundred percent. And and how many TikToks has that vegan teacher posted? She would have posted thousands during that. I think she said it was at least 2,000, over 2,000 TikToks. And they find a couple of TikToks. It's only a couple of TikToks that I keep seeing popping up and circulating on social media which are propaganda to discredit that vegan teacher clearly yeah. and it's and I just think well why don't you put it in context of the five TikToks before it and the five TikToks after it you just grab the snippet from one short TikTok and she is has only got a whole minute to explain herself when she's doing TikTok too so it's a very quick sort of thing and you could grab anything anyone says in life and you can take it out of context and you can make them seem, it doesn't matter who it is. You could grab something someone says and in the way you can make them appear the way you want them to appear sort of thing. So they want that vegan teacher. They want you to be bad people because that gives them the excuse to not listen to the truth that you're telling. Exactly. 
Um, I believe they are for sure. And I think that vegan teacher is a perfect example because obviously people are labeling her as a racist and a homophobe when she has clearly on numerous occasions said that she is anti-oppression for any group of people, whether they're human or non-human. Um, and for example, the video that she put up uh, saying the N word and not say, not labeling anyone with that word. She's clearly just saying that there is power in reclaiming words and it is an effective way of ending oppression. And she's clearly just suggesting that people embrace this word and go back to its original meaning, which is not oppressive or derogatory and actually celebrate it. Because I think that can, that is a powerful tool against people's hate and bullying. That is simply all she is stating. Yeah, definitely. And the thing is, um, she's also talking about freedom of speech. You know, when you start censoring words and when you start uh, telling people what it is they can and cannot say, it is a slippery slope. You know, where does it stop? It's like, that is an offensive word. People should refrain from saying it in, in a lot of situations. But when you're talking about it in context and you're not targeting someone, you should never target someone and, you know, belittle them and call them names. But when you're talking about things in context, it's like there are certain words we can't even discuss in context. It becomes a taboo subject and taboo subjects need to be addressed because otherwise they fester below the surface and they can get worse and worse. And, and like I said earlier, you know, it is a slippery slope. Where do you stop? You know, it's that acceptance thing. It's like, all right, we will ban this word. And then what's the next word? What's the next word? Because as an activist yourself, you would be so familiar with censorship. You know, so it's all into all this censorship is sort of intertwined, you know, it's silencing and they give reasons for silencing certain things. And yes, there is reason to silence certain things, but often there isn't. And it stops yeah. people from communicating freely because they're fearful. Um, so what do you think about the fact that you have been silenced, you have been censored, and so has that vegan teacher and countless other vegan accounts on platforms like TikTok? Yeah, it's absolutely insane that our accounts are being taken down. And I think the main reason is because people hate vegans. They don't want to hear our message that we're conveying. They don't want to be called out for being animal abusers and hypocrites. So they'll mass report our accounts and our content. And that's automatically giving a red flag alert to TikTok. And our accounts are just being removed without a proper review because they're just the system is just trusting all these people who are mass reporting the accounts and that's why it's being taken down. I think that's the main reason. Obviously there are other reasons that are higher than that where we're looking into different social media platforms that are literally um, intentionally silencing animal rights activists. Um, but yeah, it's it just should not be, it's taking away our freedom of speech essentially. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it's, the thing is a lot of people get targeted online. You know, there is this cancel culture. There are reasons people might start mass reporting you. And I think that TikTok's algorithms, the way it's structured, the actual, um, the way the, the app is built, obviously it's not taking into account or not being able to cope effectively with the mass reporting of certain accounts. Because there are trends that go on, you know, there, this is a bit of a trend to attack vegans on TikTok. I'd say it's one of the TikTok trends. And so the app should be able to handle that. It should, it, because honestly, the so sorts of accounts I have found on TikTok that are still up, that have heaps of followers and are posting away, I've seen some horrific things and they're all still up because they're not getting reported in the numbers that you and that vegan teacher were getting reported in. Exactly, and that's where the app is failing and is very inconsistent because I've had some videos that are able to stay up and others taken down for reasons that don't even associate with that video. For example, videos that are taken down for nudity when there is clearly no nudity. <laughs> Just, and I even when I appeal them, they still remain down, taken down is crazy. Oh my God. Well, that vegan teacher was saying the same thing, you know, her dog was pick videos of just her dog was getting taken down for nudity. It's just, 
what is going on? You know, it's like they're trusting. They think that something's going on. They've put in the coding. If someone's receiving this number of dislikes ratio, blah, 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 then remove it because it's probably the case that it does have nudity. But, you know, in this instance, it doesn't. Tash, why do you think it's important for activists and activism to be disruptive as opposed to sort of calm and passive? I think that's the only way that the message is actually going to be conveyed because the power behind taking direct action that is disruptive and obviously non-violent is that it will gain media attention and reach a mass audience with the message. Whereas if you're choosing a style of protesting that is focusing on being really calm and taking this loving approach, which can obviously be effective in the moment because it can start one-on-one -on -one conversations, it's not reaching a mass audience and it's not getting the world to talk about that topic. And history is a perfect example of how social change has happened through taking disruptive direct action. For example, the suffragettes, because they spent about a decade trying to work within the system and create this change by remaining peaceful and respectful. And they found that they were getting nowhere with that. So they thought they'd had enough of that and they wanted to take direct action. So what these women did in the UK was they disrupted uh, one of the biggest conferences in Britain and they pulled out their banners and started screaming and shouting that women should have the right to vote. And that's when we really saw a massive change, not only in the UK, but around the world. And about a decade after, women were actually granted the right to vote in the UK and many other nations as well. So that's just one example of how social change has been created through taking direct action. And I think if we want to achieve animal liberation, we need to be taking disruptive direct action to actually achieve that media attention and get the world talking about animal rights. That reminds me of, I think it was Bernie Sanders was doing like a, or a talk to a, quite a large audience and a couple of girls jumped up and tried to take over the microphone and they were talking about dairy and animal agriculture and how terrible it was. And you know, that ended up in the media, you know, that was spoken about. They might have been booed at that moment. They might be mocked currently, but they're going to be looked back on similarly to those women you described going and being disruptive. Exactly. Yeah. At the time, all of those activists were laughed at. They were treated beyond appallingly by general society and they were the real game changers that created justice. They yep. are the heroes that we look at, look at. Exactly. It starts a conversation. And it's, it's such a shame because I feel like people haven't taken this opportunity. That vegan teacher has managed to make through TikTok. She managed to amass, you know, 1.7 million followers. She had most of TikTok sort of at least, you know, the vegan was on their radar, this word, this philosophy. And it's, it's a shame because I feel like more vegans could have taken that opportunity to talk about it. Since people were focused and looking in this direction, they might have been looking over, you know, they were looking over because she was disruptive. She was putting controversial stuff out there. She was being unapologetic. She was saying it how it is. She was talking about other controversial topics, but oppression, it's, it's, Oppression is a controversial topic, um, especially in regards to animal agriculture. And so she got everyone's attention. And um, it's a shame more people didn't rise up and use that opportunity to educate people on veganism. Instead, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and instead, other vegans are <laughs> trying to silence her. It's like, no, you should be doing the opposite. You, you don't have to pay attention to her, but use this opportunity to talk. Exactly. I was just about to say that instead, everyone, including many people in the vegan community, decided to try and bring her down and jump on the jump on board with all the other non-vegans saying that she's a racist and a homophobe and saying that she shouldn't have a platform but she's honestly one of the most if not the most powerful animal rights activists that has ever existed because she has reached tens of millions of people with the animal rights message she has inspired so many she has literally disrupted social media and the whole online world yeah. internationally absolute phenomenon yeah exactly 
she should be seen as the hero. And I and think this is one just day she will perfect be. example of people laughing and shaming. And I, it's just so sad to see the, the whole vegan community just about, just on board with that too, with the yeah, shaming. They're getting, they're getting really sucked sad. into these side arguments. You know, oh, she said mm. this. Oh my God, she, oh, I'm sorry she's not woke. I'm sorry she's not a 20 year old woke university student that's studying politics. I'm sorry. No, she's who she is. She's a 56 year old woman who is passionate about animal rights. What is the 3.5% rule? Do you know much about it? And can you tell me a little bit more about it if you do? Yeah, so basically this is in reference to direct action and it's been described by Professor Sidney Taro as the strongest weapon of social movements because it generates attention and it broadens the circle of debate and inspires participation in action. When it comes to non-violent direct action, you don't need a majority or even a large minority. All you need is 3.5% of the population engaged in sustained non-violent direct action and you will win every single time. Just we, we need more people mm -hmm. taking direct action. It's only 3.5% of the population, but we need you taking direct action if you want to see animal liberation. Wayne Schwing, do you know him? He's the co-founder of Direct Action. No, I don't. I highly recommend watching his videos. The way he describes how important direct action is for social change is just amazing. He says if you can get, so a standard person has 100 people in their relationship circle, and if you can get just three of those people to take some form of direct action for animal rights. Oh, wow. Where, or yeah, that's already really nice hit. Yeah. what you need to create that change yeah i'm being a bit pessimistic but <laughs> like when you put it like yeah. that it really does sound like oh my gosh you only need a handful of vegans and they'll have a domino effect sort of thing like it is possible to get three out of a hundred people to go and do activism with you like that seems yeah. possible i mean yeah, our, exactly. our whole family sort of had a domino effect it was like boom 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 and then next minute we're all vegan and then my family here you know my partner's vegan now so it is definitely a possible thing. You only need one person to knock over. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, because I guess that's how even in previous social movements with the suffragettes, it just took that that one woman and her daughters to do that disruptive protest. And then that sort of became a worldwide movement. So it's, yeah, just like inspiring people to be active as well is obviously really important. It is tough as an activist to know what's the right way to broach the topic, what's the right way to say it. And also when you're talking about other things like censorship and the censorship of certain words, it, mm. it becomes like sort of a controversial, it just shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a topic that, I don't know why everyone's not just vegan yet, she's crazy. It's crazy that there is such a violent ideology and way of life that we perceive as normal. I wish I had activists like you going into the Coles I'm shopping at as a kid and hearing what you have to say. Like just something you yeah, don't forget. Yeah. You know, I think it's amazing that you do that. Um, exactly. It's super inspirational. Yeah. Like when was the first time you ever were like okay i'm gonna go in out into the public realm and i'm going to tell them the truth like when was the first time that happened it sort of built up built up gradually because i guess the first time that i actually spoke out in a public area about animal rights was completely uncalled for like i hadn't planned for it it just happened in that moment and it was when I was at an RSPCA dog walk and we were just doing like a outreach session and I decided to do a live stream and just talking to the people on the live stream, explaining to them why RSPCA is actually a horrific, a horrific excuse for an animal welfare organisation when they're approving things like the maceration of baby male chicks in the egg industry and forcing six month old pigs into carbon dioxide gas ch chambers and putting their label on those That's products. Crazy. And putting the RSPCA approved label on literally body parts of animals they're supposedly looking after. It's like, you didn't do a very good job of looking after it. Part of its body is in that wrapping. Like what is going on with RSPCA? I've always, just, it, they're just there to ease the minds and the conscience of your everyday consumer. That's it very sad.
Exactly. It's just just as corrupt as animal agriculture itself. They obviously have an affiliation with those murder industries and they're getting lots of money to put their labeling on those products. And everyone has so much trust in RSPCA. They think, yeah, this is a good thing for the animals. So I'm going to buy those products, but they're literally paying someone for the most horrific animal abuse that exists on this planet. It's absolutely crazy. Um, so yeah, that's exactly why we decided to go to this RSPCA dog walk because everyone cares about dogs, but not about pigs. And so I was just explaining on the live stream why I was there, what happens in murder factories and uh, meat, dairy and egg farms. And I noticed a lot of people who were walking past me were really listening in to what I had to say. So just over time, my voice just became louder and louder to literally to the point where I was just speaking so loud. I just wanted everyone to know the truth. And that actually got a bit of media attention itself. That um, resulted in an interview with the West Australian. And I ended up being on the front cover of that newspaper. And I thought, wow, this, this could be going somewhere. This is really cool. Like a lot of people are talking about animal rights now. It's literally on the front cover of the West Australian newspaper and soon after that action my friend and I came up with a random idea for her to dress in a cow onesie and it was a completely silent protest and she was just in the cow onesie mourning the animal flesh in the meat aisle which is more commonly known as the death aisle because it's literally death not meat um and that video went viral we got over a million views on facebook and it was in lad bible like it just went insanely viral and so we decided to do it again and this time i decided to speak out exactly like i did in the rspca dog walk when i was filming her and then that sort of merged in a, in a combination of two where i decided to go out myself in the cow onesie and speak out of the horrors that are happening in animal agriculture. And that's sort of where it stemmed into where I am now with all these different sort of creative disruptions inside supermarkets and other places where violence is sold and consumed. I find it really inspirational that you are uh, capable of going and doing this direct action. Um, but at the same time, I think, well, it shouldn't be inspirational. It should just be something we should all be able to go and do. And by you going and doing it, you're certainly forging a path for others. Like, I want to do it. I look at you and I think I want to be able to go and do what she does. Like, have, you know, be able to get out there and scream the truth unapologetically. Um, but unfortunately, I have to be honest and admit that I am still, I feel like I'm still being silenced by animal abusers and, and I need a break free from that and go and do it. And so I am, okay, so <laughs> Tash might be coming to Melbourne this year to come and stay with me. And I am hoping that we can go and do some activism together. And um, yeah, I, I can't wait. And I'm truly honored that hopefully you'll be here very soon and that I can go and support you and hopefully start finding my voice too on the street and doing disruptive activism. Definitely, I'm gonna be over very soon and we are gonna be out there speaking the truth and creating social change. <laughs> Yes. And so, yeah, everyone stay tuned for that because I can't wait. We're going to be doing more videos. Uh, we've got lots of plans. <laughs> so that sort of brings me to the end of this chat, Tash. Thank you so much for coming and talking about your work and about the suffering that is going on in our society behind closed doors that, that should be acknowledged and stopped um and like i said i greatly appreciate the work you do and it's very inspirational so thank you thank you for being here thank you and right back at you i think you're not giving yourself enough credit here <laughs> i mean you have a massive platform and you're using your voice for the non-human animals on here and i think that's truly amazing and honorable so thank you so much as well thank you